The apex predator in Haran is something that used to be a man, but has long since lost its humanity. This creature is so heavily infested with the Haran virus that it can no longer tread outside during the day unless it's willing to risk its own end. Instead, it stalks the night, looking for anyone caught outside when the sun sets. It can move as fast as a sprinting person and climb any object like the most professional of parkours. Parkourers. Parkers. Whatever. So, we are of course talking about the volatile from light. With that intro concluded, let's get to the changes the Haran virus has inflicted upon the body, seeing as the skeleton has definitely been changed on this person. Somewhere along the line, people infected began to exhibit some serious aversion to light. This is seen somewhat in the biters with their sluggishness during the day and their quicker abilities during the night. It appears, however, that as the time passed, certain traits the biters have become more rooted in permanence. So to get to the volatiles, let's first discuss what seems to be an early form of the volatile symptom taking hold. When interacting with biters, we see that they move slowly, usually. But if the setting is correct, such as it being nighttime, the biters will begin to transform. This transformation is important as it sheds light on what we will see later. After being hit, or if a human is making enough noise, the biter will become something known as a nightwalker. Nightwalkers appear to be quite prevalent in the biter population. They are quicker, more aggressive, but still fairly weak. They will give chase to a human prey, and for the most part, keep up. But if you would like a more comprehensive breakdown of a biter and nightwalkers, I'll link a card up at the top now. Anyhow, the nightwalkers show us something. First, that not every single human will become a nightwalker. Because of this, two possibilities exist. The nightwalker is actually possible to an infection timing. A walker that has been around too long but never progressed to the aggressive state appears to become degraded with time. More newly infected people who are not so degraded appear to retain the ability to become nightwalkers. The second possibility is genetic. Somewhere within their genetic coding exists instructions for protein complexes, perhaps more Neanderthal genes than another person, or even less considering the height, which is interactive with by the Haran virus, which in turn exhibits the Nightwalker trait in more volatile ways. For the sake of this video, I would lead more towards the genetic explanation than simple degradation of the body, mainly due to the fact that we see plenty of biters who are actually still quite viable yet never turn into a Nightwalker. So to understand the leap to volatile, we must first learn about how genes are expressed and how a virus or environment may bring out a certain trait. So in psychology exists the idea of nature versus nurture. Myself being a biologist, I believe most things are due to nature. Genes supreme. Ironically, my fiance is a psychologist and therapist. That being the case, she believes nurture is really what inspires certain mentalities and interactions. Now, don't tell her I said this, but I can kind of see her point on how this may be the case. However, in the Volatiles case, I believe it to be both. A perfect mixture of virus, genetics, and environment. The virus, as we all know, is highly mutagenic. It turns almost everyone it infects into shambling infected. There are those who are more prone to, say, like, blue-collar work that are larger, and then you have the masses who are run of the mill who are turned into biters. Basically, the point is that this virus appears to be working with what's there to determine what you become. This brings us again to genetics. I know I'm harping on this, but it's important to understand that while our genes are very similar from person to person, even the smallest of changes, a different protein, a random enzyme mutation, can have large consequences on the body when something as mutagenic as the Haran virus is introduced into the system. For instance, if your body had a certain string of DNA that coded for increased muscle mass and retention of that muscle mass, you may become something like a goon. This may be caused by the fact that your ancestor hooked up with a Neanderthal thousands of years ago. Or maybe if your ancestor refrained and you were just pure Cro-Magnon, which may make you taller, but you'll be more skinny, so you will not have this increased muscle mass. The interesting thing about genetics that we are starting to find, which may seem obvious, is that the environment can play a huge role on how our genes are expressed. Which brings us into the environment portion of the argument, of course. Take psychopathy, for instance. Usually, it is expressed as a pure biological trait. This one is caused by our genes of our body and appear to not be overridden or expressed due to environment. However, sociopathy is an ailment that could exist in a person but never truly come out until the correct stipulations are met. Say a person is comfortable their whole life. The sociopathic traits are never expressed and they go through their life maybe feeling a little detached from people but for the most part are fine. Here they have the genes for it but not the environment to send them over. A person who has sociopathy may have had a chaotic past or was struggling as a child, they will see people as essentially objects to be used rather than thinking and feeling people, so this would be quite normal for them. Their environment and genes have come together to create a person who would likely survive and quality of life may even increase, but they would feel massively detached from virtually everyone. Now it is possible for them to feel loyalties, but we won't tread too far into the psychology realm. Despite this, the importance is the expression. When a biter becomes a nightwalker for a while, eventually they will calm back down when the stimulus is gone. Afterwards, they will revert back to their shambling 
themselves and there is no need to change. But what if that stimulus never went away? Or perhaps when the body becomes a Nightwalker, rather than reverting back, it remains in this hypervigilant and active state. I believe that this is where we get the volatiles from. Volatiles are perfect blends of their genetics interacting with the virus, more than likely due to a stimulus from their environment. At some point, a human activated this hunting ability in them, and with interactions with their DNA, they stayed constantly hyped up, we'll call it. This could also stem from mental health issues that were either pronounced or underlying in their original human form, but post-infection are in full display. My hypothesis on this is a biter came across a person at a certain point post-infection life. When this happened, their Nightwalker traits came out as they were genetically predispositioned for this ability. However, a subgroup of Nightwalkers, unlike the rest, had their body continuing to remain in this heightened state despite the prey either being captured or escaping. This could be caused by either an underlying mental health issue, continued stimulus in the area keeping them alert, or a combination of the two. Over time, this would yield a highly aggressive creature. Physically, the volatile is just as the name implies, extremely volatile. A thing to note about hypervigilance is that it has a profound physical effect on the body. Consider it to almost be anxiety inducing. This wreaks havoc on the chemicals within the human body, but for this we will specifically refer to adrenaline. Adrenaline is a complex hormone, but in it exists epinephrine. So what does epinephrine do? Specifically, it can increase feelings of fear and anger. So for volatiles, this would be anger as it chases prey, but also it does have fear. We see this when the sun begins to rise. The volatiles will cease all chases and flee back to the darkness. This fear is pretty intense to make it completely forget about the human that was just mere feet in front of it. Another thing about epinephrine is it increases heart rate, muscle strength, blood pressure, and sugar metabolism, all integral to chase and keep up with fleeing prey. The strength exhibited by a volatile is massive, able to pin down a fully grown man with little to no effort. The blood pressure would make sure the muscles are supplied with plenty of blood to allow this creature to run after non-infected and climb structures should they be out of reach. Increased sugar metabolism would also keep them supplied with the energy to do such. The increased metabolism would also seemingly have another effect, more viral particles. With the body kicked into maximum overdrive, it's clear virus production may be increased in the process. This has affected the creature, which explains the fear mentioned earlier. Again, just kind of a short rehash, the rabies virus makes an infected creature sensitive to light. The volatiles are no different considering that the Huron virus is a form of rabies. UV light is damaging to them and can outright take them out if they are exposed long enough. With these three parameters coming together, this has physically yielded a creature with many different morphological traits from you or I. So what are these traits? Starting with the feet, we see a creature who is becoming more animalistic with the passing days. Now humans are typically supposed to run on the balls of their feet, but when we slow down, we walk on our heels. This is how our legs are designed with energy transfer when we are hunting. However, the volatile, even when it's just standing, despite having a plantigrade leg structure, will exclusively walk on the balls of its feet. This has caused them to almost continuously lean over as they walk or run. The legs of this creature are extremely muscular and have the means to supply this muscle. Large veins run all over the legs and virtually all hair has been lost, which is typically what we see with the infected. This loss of hair might actually be important considering that they are running around a subtropical to tropical area and as such, heat would be a factor. So less hair, less heat retention. Anyways, this muscle is used to run down prey but remain agile. It can also assist with climbing as they kick off climbing structures and leap. Speaking of leaping, these powerful legs allow them to leap onto non-infected humans, basically ending them. In the pelvic region, it seems that all has been lost if this thing was originally male. Total bummer, my dude. Moving up to the abdomen and chest region, we see that the muscles in this area have also been increased, just like everywhere else, virtually having a bodybuilder physique. It would presumably be necessary considering the heightened state the volatile finds itself in on a constant basis. The most glaring thing we can see are the addition of bones protruding from the sides of the body, but we will get to those and how they form momentarily. The shoulders are interesting on this creature. For one reason or another, it seems the skin has ripped and been completely lost. This could be due to the fact that the volatile has grown quite aggressively since its infection. Skin has some pretty good elasticity, but it had to tear somewhere. And considering the size of the shoulders and trapezius muscles, this was the weak link. The skin was more than likely stretched to its maximum and then torn away from the area as it saw immense growth. Moving down the arms, we see as per usual, muscle and skeletal growth has increased making larger arms. This is useful in the standard ways of grabbing humans and ensuring prey won't escape, but also once again for climbing and pulling themselves up structures. The hands of the volatile appear to be increased in size somewhat and are now tipped with claws. These will be used to slash and tear open people. But before getting to the more interesting portion of the body, let's discuss the internal changes. A few things would need to happen to the body of this person. First, muscle growth would need to become greatly increased. To allow the body to operate the capacity the volatile does, every large muscle group and accessory muscle group would be beefed 
up. This would require a multitude of hormones and protein synthesis. Human growth hormone would be released in massive quantities, which would not only impact the muscle growth, but the bone growth as well. The bones of this person would be reaching near cancerous levels due to this infection. Growth plates would presumably be reactivated, causing them to grow taller than your normal person would. Now internally, the bones would be fairly similar to ours, but I assume they would be thicker concerning the legs and arms. We also see that the rib cage has some changes, so odds are the ribs have become thicker and larger as well. And we could determine this by the size of the ribs that seem to jut out from the skin. These are known as false ribs. It's easy to think that they are the floating ribs, but nope. The false ribs attach directly to the cartilage of rib seven, which then attaches to the sternum. These ribs are not attached as securely as the others. As such, it appears that they broke away from the cartilage and pierced the skin. It should also be noted that you actually have three false ribs per side of your body. They exist in the same region as the bones jutting out on the volatile. This indicates bone growth forcefully caused these bones in some cases to leave their natural positions. In this case, the true ribs were locked in place by the sternum and the false ribs were able to grow outwards. This is definitely seen in the head of the volatile. The skull, for the most part, is intact. Eyes, nose, ears, all with no hair. But the jaw of this creature is the main attraction. At some point, it cracked in half around the middle of the chin. So imagine compressing an arch upwards. Eventually, it would get to a point where the middle of it would crack as that's the weak point. Same premise with the jaw. The bone growth has caused it to crack in half, which is advantageous as it increases the bite radius and makes it look horrifying. Another thing to note about the head of the volatile is that it does have a ranged attack. Should a player get cheeky and jump onto the side of the wall or building and cannot be reached by the volatile, much like how the toad produces acidic stomach contents that it can fire, so too can this infection form. Presumably made under the same methods, it can fire this acid form from its body to hit a person doing damage over time. And considering they eat people, this could damage them, trapping them where they are, or force them to lose their grip and fall down to the awaiting jaws of the volatile. The volatile is a dangerous and violent form the infection takes. To me, it seems like a perfect storm of environment, virus, mutation, and pre-infection genetics all coming together to make a creature not capable of coming down from a stimulus. So its body adapts and it becomes even more violent in the process. But should one of these parameters not exist, the person wouldn't be able to become such a creature. Anyhow, I hope you guys enjoyed my video over the volatile. Maybe we will see more mutations and light too. If you enjoyed, leaving a like helps the video get out there and subbing is a great way to keep up the channel. I will drop my Twitter, Discord, merch, and Patreon links in the description if anyone is interested in that. And I'd like to thank a few of my patrons. It's Not A Spoon, Joseph Givens, RTM Shortage, Freedom Units 44, and The Lone Titan. Thank you guys for your continued support. And to the rest of my patrons, thank you guys as well. Alright, so that does it for me. I will see y'all in the next one.